in the meantime. Sure, sir. And sure, Dr. Sir. Arjun, uh, thank you for uh, connecting to the session to everyone online and offline. So, so the, good afternoon all. This is Dr. Divyansh. I'm the moderator for the session. And the, the title of the session is uh, uh, Advances in Diagnosis and Management of uh, PCV. So the speaker is Dr. Kelvin Tao. Uh, Dr. Kelvin uh, is consultant at Singapore National Eye Center, and he has a strong interest in clinical research in field of medical retina. And in particular, his focus is on real world outcomes and how imaging techniques help in the advances of uh, pathophysiology and therapy for neovascular AMD. Uh, he has multiple awards to his honor and has multiple uh, research interests like real world outcome of retina diseases from the registry data, imaging of the retina diseases and gene therapy for retina diseases. So uh, welcome Dr. Kelvin and uh, you can take over the rise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invite uh, to speak today uh, to all of you. Um, just going to share my slides. Okay. Sorry about that. Can you see that clearly? Uh, Dr. Arjun sir, uh, I'm able to see that. Shall we go ahead? Uh, yeah, this slide is clear. Slide? It's clear, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about advances in diagnosis and management for PCV. Here's my, my financial disclosures. So quick outline of what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the evolution of um, a diagnosis for PCV uh, in terms of uh, using ICGA, which we know is the gold standard, uh, some non-ICGA methods, as well as some novel imaging techniques in PCV. And then I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about treatments and some of the evolutions there. So I think, as we all know, PCV is a type of neovascular AMD, uh, and there are key features uh, essentially that suggest PCV in these eyes, uh, essentially things like serosanguinous maculopathy, um, in these eyes, there are few or no drusen. And of course, our gold standard diagnosis for PCV will be the use of endocyanin green angiography or ICGA. Uh, recently, of course, um, P uh, OCT has also shown uh, to be very useful in distinguishing PCV from other forms of typical neovascular AMD. So I'm going to put this up here. Um, and essentially, uh, you know, PCV, the entity, was first described by Yan Yanuzzi in 1982. Um, Big Spade then did the first ICG for an Afro-American Afro lady uh, in uh, 1995, showing these polyps uh, around the optic disc. Uh, now, if we fast forward all the way to uh, 2012, which is completion of the Everest trial, which uh, is a big landmark trial for the treatment for PCV. Um, besides the fact that uh, we talked about combination treatment here, which I will cover a little bit later, uh, what Everest did for us was also help to uh, define our diagnostic criteria for um, polyps. And essentially, it was this ICGA diagnosis. You had to have point hyperfluorescence, a nodular appearance, um, sorry about that, uh, a hyperfluorescent halo, uh, and the associated branching vascular network or normal vascular network. And on video ICGA, you'd see these parcital polyps as you can see here on the left. Now, the trouble with ICGA is that it is a bit invasive, time consuming, uh, and has a cost to it. And of course, with advance in OCT, uh, the technology improvements, uh, you know, we're, we're really finding that uh, there are a lot of features on OCT can, that can help us make this diagnosis. And this evidence is not new, really. It's spanned back all the way from 2007, where uh, this Japanese group described the double layer sign, essentially what was the branching vascular network. And they described, this other group described uh, irregular um, pigment epithelial detachment. Uh, and uh, of course, if you looked at it from the top, the on detection of polyps and uh, uh, and a branching vascular network uh, right there. Many groups have taken this further and looked at using OCTA or optical coherence tomography and geography to look at how well uh, this new modality can detect PCBs. And here you can see it's not actually very good. If you looked at the sensitivity, it's actually quite low in this particular paper. Um, but we then took this a little bit further in our group in Singapore. And what we found was that it's not really the on fast OCTA that helps uh, to make this uh, detection of PCV, really, it's the cross sectional OCTA. And if you use that uh, together with uh, some of the other uh, OCT signs, you can actually get quite good accuracy in detecting uh, these polyps. So, one of the other things that we did here was also we uh, then pulled together uh, some experts from Asia to propose uh, some non ICGA features uh, from all the literature. 
to see whether we can make uh, the, the differentiation of PCB from other forms of AMD a bit more accurate. And after going through the literature, our experts picked out nine features. So uh, extensive submetal hemorrhage, orange nodule, uh, on fast OCT complex RP elevation, a sharp peak PED, a sub RPE ring like lesion, and complex multilobular PED, uh, as well as a double layer sign, thick choroid, and SRF more than IRF as the nine features uh, on OCT that could help to make this differentiation. Now we took these nine features, we put them together, we put the, the work group through uh, grading these features, and we ran a validation on 40 PCV and 40 non-PCV eyes to see whether this, these features could distinguish uh, the two. And what we found here was that the top three uh, features were essentially OCT features, um, sub-RPE ring-like lesion, uh, on-fast OCT complex RP elevation, and a sharp peak PED, which really gave the best kind of accuracy. So we divided them into major and minor criteria. And what we found was that if we combine the three major criteria and any one of the minor criteria, our accuracy to differentiate PCV from non-PCV was actually very, very, very good. Um, giving an AUC of 0.91. Now, um, if you only had OCT and had nothing else, what we found was that if you had two out of three of these features, uh, your accuracy was also excellent. So I'm going to repeat that, the sub-RP ring lesion there on the leftmost picture, on fast OCT complex RP elevation, and a sharp peak PED there on the right. And so we published a nice paper here in ophthalmology uh, describing these signs uh, and how this might help. I'm going to go through some examples now. Uh, if you look at this OCT cross-section on the top, you see uh, some of those features that I described, uh, the peak PED, uh, the sub-RP ring lesion, and if you look at the on fast OCT, uh, you can see that the uh, uh, complex RPE elevation there. And many have asked, you know, how exactly do you uh, work out this complex RPE elevation? And really the, the answer is that it is these irregular kind of graphic looking patches uh, that they're not round, uh, which gives it away. Now uh, there on the ICGA, you can see the polyp. Uh, let's look at another example here. So uh, likewise, you can see a sub-RPE ring lesion. Uh, you can see peak PEDs in the sky. And again, on the on-fast OCT scan, you can see these complex elevations. And again, you can see those polyps very nicely on the ICGA. Now let's look at this ICG here with a hotspot there. You know, it, very, it could be mistaken for a polyp. But if you look at the OCT scan itself, you don't see any of those features that were described and of course, this is a type three or rat lesion. We went on further to use, to apply the same diagnostic criteria in eyes that were persistently active. So these eyes were treated with some anti-VEGF and uh, they were persistently active. They had suboptimal response. There was still some fluid left like that picture on the bottom. And what we found was that the sharp peak PED and the ring lesion maintained as uh, a very high diagnostic criteria, uh, but the complex RP elevation was replaced by the presence of an orange nodule. Now, uh, we took this a little bit further and we got our experts then to use OCT alone to draw a ring of where they would apply PDT. And we did this for uh, uh, all our eyes and essentially we got graders to mark, draw out the area of the uh, polypoidal lesion as well as the branching vascular network. We combined that with the rings that the expert had um, decided, put them together, uh, and these were all well, representation of some of the, the eyes that were graded and, uh, uh, and the PDT spots marked out only using OCT. And what we found was that the portion of polypoidal lesions that was covered was excellent. All, all our experts covered all the polypoidal lesion, uh, but uh, only about 90% of the branching vascular network was covered by these rings just using OCT alone. So this is an example of, of very well good coverage. You can see uh, in most of the, the rings here, uh, the PDT spot is very tight to the lesion. Uh, in this particular case, it didn't uh, do so well. Uh, and you can see that all the experts really missed almost the same area. So the superior part of the lesion was missed. And if you look at that OCT cut through A, that very uh, small or minimal uh, RPE uh, elevation or double layer sign was the bit that all experts thought were not important uh, to be covered with PDT.
So again, we've got another nice paper out of this, looking at how OCT or non-ICG uh, uh, diagnostic criteria can help uh, in the, not only the identification of polyps, but in the treatment using PDT. So what's next in the diagnosis for PCB? So we know uh, ICGA, gold standard, very good. We talked about some of the OCT cross-sectional features. But of course, the new kid on the block is or, you know, not so new anymore, is uh, OCT angiography. And so this is an OCTA uh, done on the Plex Elite uh, with uh, custom uh, segmentation, which picks up both the polypoidal lesion, as you can see there, uh, right uh, on the top right, and the entirety of the branching vascular network. So with good strep source machines now, we can get imaging that looks like this. Here's another example for the branching vascular network with the polypoidal lesions corresponding very nicely to what is seen uh, on ICG. Here's another example uh, of a polypoidal lesion there and uh, done on OCTA on the right. Uh, I've loaded up that uh, ICGA just to get a little bit of reference of what uh, these look like. Uh, but uh, many of you might say this OCTA looks a little bit different and it is. Now, what was done here was that we took um, repeated scans of the OCTA and we merged them together uh, with averaging to combine a very high definition picture uh, of this polypoidal lesion. Uh, then we went one step further and we, because of all the um, averaging uh, and all the information that was uh, uh, gained on these OCTA scans, we were able to then reconstitute this three-dimensionally to look at how these polyps uh, really relate to the branching vascular network. So you can see here the polyp is really on a different level from that branching vascular network. So let's look at another example here. So you can see that polypoidal lesion there in all its complexity, and really it's there sitting above with a feeding vessel coming from the branching vascular network. Uh, we took it one step further. We looked at the structural <clears throat> OCT cross-sectional scan. We segmented out the RPE there in green, and we combined the two images together. So you can see here the polypoidal uh, lesion in relation to the RPE, the RPE just kind of draped over that, uh, um, that polyp there. Okay, so let's go to the next, uh, next example. Here we go. So here another example of uh, that RPE draped uh, over the polypoidal lesion in the branching vascular network. Here in this particular eye, the PD is a lot um, bigger than the one that you saw just now. Right, so that's so much for the diagnosis of PCV. So we've seen that we can move away from gold standard ICGA to look perhaps in cross-sectional uh, OCT scans and then moving forwards with OCTA and uh, advances in how we can process these images. We can get some really nice pictures of how those polyps in the branching vascular network uh, are in relation to each other. I'm gonna go through very quickly about the treatment. So uh, as mentioned previously, we talked about the Everest 2 trial, which looked at combination of PDT with ranibizumab versus ranibizumab monotherapy. And here we showed combination therapy did much better than monotherapy alone. And this is really one of the first landmark trials for uh, PCB treatment. Now, if we look at anti-VEGF treatment, um, Planet, while it was supposed to be about rescue PDT, really was uh, gave a lot of information about using aflibercept as monotherapy for PCV. If you can see here, both in the rescue arm and the monotherapy arm, the patients did very well. And what's important is that more than 80% of the patients did not require rescue PD up to two years. So good evidence for liver set for PCV. With newer agents like brolicizumab in the Hawk and Harrier sub-analysis, uh, what was found was that both in the, that there was uh, no difference in uh, the outcomes between brolicizumab and the liver set up to week 96 and many of the eyes with PCV were able to extend up to 12 weeks. Now, we have good evidence for the two agents of Libicep and Brolicizumab, but really we don't treat our patients according to trial protocol. And uh, you know, here are the three big uh, treatment regimens that we use for typical AMD. Uh, what's most popular, I suppose, now is to treat and extend. That's what I use, and that's what I know many of my uh, contemporaries use as well worldwide. But the trouble with treat and extend for PCV is that while it works well for typical AMD, sometimes it can cause uh, bad bleeds when the extension interval goes out for too long. And if we look here, uh, what we did was then to see if we could tailor treat and extend for PCV itself. And what we did was essentially, uh, if the polypoidal lesion was still present after three loading injections, we would give three more. 
uh, there on the right, and then we'd start our treat and extend uh, regimen from there. And what we found was that with this personalized arm versus a fixed eight weekly arm, both did just as well, uh, but with the personalized arm, we could achieve uh, almost 30% more closure rate uh, with the additional three injections. Should, do, should we do completely away with PDT then, since we have good evidence for anti-VEGF monotherapy? So I'm gonna leave you with these tables here. So pros and cons for PDT, um, just some uh, summary information. Uh, in our pcbt and &E trial, we found almost 60% closure with eight injections versus 70% closure of polyploidal lesions with five injections and one PDT in Everest. Um, and really this is to mitigate the risk of hemorrhage. As you can see here in monotherapy in the Everest arm, it's almost double the rate of bad submacular hemorrhage versus combination. So I'm gonna go through this uh, pretty quickly because uh, I'm a bit cognizant of time. So here was, is, is a, a matrix of how we think that we can uh, suggest treatment for uh, essentially any eye that comes with a, a neovascular AMD. If you were inactive at three months after your three loading, you could go on and safely do a treat and extend. But if you saw any PCB specific markers, for example, sharp peak PD or ring signs, you should consider PCB specific treatment. Now, if you are consistently active at month three after the first three injections, then look for, really look for those signs or do an ICG to see if PCB is present. And if PCB is present, you can modify your treatment by intensifying your anti vegf treatment, switching an agent or performing some PDT. Um, at the same time, you know, don't forget um, the trusty old focal laser, which can be very helpful in extra foveal um, uh, polyps. So just some tips here on how we how I do PDT. In my first PDT, I do the entire polypoidal lesion and branching vascular network. And subsequent ones, I just treat the active polyps itself. So I'll leave you with this summary slide here. Um, and uh, essentially, lots of new diagnostics in PCV and some new and different ways in which we can use anti vegf for the treatment of PCP. Thank you very much. We have a paucity of uh, photodynamic therapy now because uh, vertiporphin is not available. So we are actually forced to move into monotherapy bar focal laser of the polyps or branching vascular networks if they're outside the foveal vascular zone. So um, what is your, I mean, let me come to the direct question. What is your head and heart take on brolucizumab versus uh, aflibercept in PCV? So uh, in Singapore, brolucizumab is not approved for use, unfortunately, because of the high IOI rate. But um, the experiences from you know some of our, my colleagues overseas actually shows that brolucizumab is really, working really, really well. Um, you know, uh, barring that that risk of, of of severe IOI. So I actually think that it does it will work better for PCB patients, uh, but perhaps you would reserve these for, you know, those that are persistently active. Uh, you know, if you can get away with treating it with whatever you have, a flibicep or ranibizumab and things are quiet, then so be it. Uh, but if they're persistently active, then it might be worthwhile to get a discussion with the patient uh, to give that one problem so have to see how things settle down. Okay, okay Dr. Shah, you were asking something. No, sir, I, I was not asking like right now. I don't have any questions right now because I joined quite late. I will, I'm there for the next session, sir. Okay, Divyansh? Yeah, uh, good evening, sir. Yeah. So a very nice presentation, Dr. Kelvin. So uh, one question, the uh, very beautiful images of the three-dimensional structure of the PCV and very nice... Uh, Images, can you just give us a detail that what was the platform used and what was the software used? Um, okay, so so with that, we used um, the Plex Elite uh, OCTA, so the sub source. Uh, it's you know, currently is a research machine, but it, it does beautiful, these beautiful images. Uh, so it's a little bit tricky to acquire these images because we needed to scan at least three images um, uh, consecutively. Uh, and then we had to, uh, and it was it was a custom MATLAB uh, software to uh, do the averaging uh, for all these images. Um, and then from there, with all that information, we could then uh, slice it uh, from, from the on-fast and, and recreate a, a three-dimensional uh, image of the PCV. Um, yeah, it's, it's a little bit, it is a little bit time consuming. So uh, at the moment, it's probably still in the realm of uh, imaging research. 
Uh, and, you know, hopefully if we can get these to be a bit more automated, uh, we might get some really nice images moving forward. Okay, Theo, may I ask you one more uh, question? Um, see, when we are using a combination therapy of aflibercept plus photodynamic therapy, how many injections of aflibercept do you do before you repeat an ICG and decide whether the polyp has disappeared and you decide on combination therapy? Like probably with the ranibizumab, we were considering an injection followed by photodynamic therapy a little earlier on, but what the aflibercept has it changed. Okay. So um, there are, I don't think there's a fixed number to this. So obviously if things were still active, you still had fluid after, you know, a good three or four flibicept, then definitely repeat that ICGA. Uh, well, some good uh, giveaway signs uh, on even on OCT. So we're talking about eyes here that have uh, all the fluid has resolved and you're worried perhaps that a polyp is still there. Uh, one of the good giveaway signs is that that whole sharp P, pick P, ED starts to collapse and looks a little bit more triangular. Uh, then you can be a little bit confident that um, that polyp has closed. Uh, you know, if you still continue to see that sharp PED with a sub RP e ring, then it's likely that polyp is still open. Thank you very much, Dr. Theo.